Hey all, thank you so much for spending this time with us, learning from the Bible. I hope you will be blessed, um, but also challenged by this message. Uh, I want to ask a favor of you. We cannot continue without your help. There are so many expenses, and as you know, this year has been a very difficult one for churches. There are a lot of expenses, and we have to meet those expenses every month. Now, you can help us to continue by making a one-time donation or by committing to a monthly gift at calvarybirmingham.com and click on giving. You can also mail that gift to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, 1738 Morgan Park Road, Pelham, Alabama, 35124. And all gifts are tax deductible. Thank you so much for partnering with us and may the Lord bless you. Good day, everybody. That rain sure sounds fantastic out there. We are continuing our chapter through 2 Peter, our study of 2 Peter chapter 1. This will be the third week that we've been in 2 Peter, and we will be wrapping up chapter 1 today. Now, 1 Peter... As we talked about the last couple of weeks, 1 Peter warned of a great increase in persecution that Peter predicted would be coming soon. And that increase in persecution came with Nero, and many thousands of Christians were killed, including Peter himself. So when Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4.12, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you, he was quite right about what was to come. And when Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 2, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, he was also correct. The early church had to deal with false teachers and false doctrines, and the church of today deals with them too. So 1 Peter dealt with dangers from outside the church, and now his second letter deals with dangers from inside the church. Second Peter deals with the emergence of false teachers and of false teaching. And this is not new to us going verse by verse through the Bible. We dealt with this in several of Paul's letters that we studied prior to this, such as uh, his letter to the Romans, to the Galatians, First and Second Timothy, as well as Titus. Jude's letter does this as well, and for that reason, in fact, we, as we observed before, Second Peter and Jude strike very similar chords. That letter those letters that were written were not that far apart in time and deal with similar subjects. And, you know, that would probably not be shocking for us to understand. What might be shocking to us is that the false teachers and their false doctrines, they really haven't changed that much from way back then. Now, a doctrine is a set of ideas or beliefs that are taught or believed to be true. So then, biblical doctrine refers to teachings that align with the written Word of God, that is, the Bible. False doctrine is any idea that adds to, that takes away from, that contradicts, or nullifies the doctrine given to us in God's Word. And one issue with false doctrines is that they take what is established in grace by faith, and they make it about works and about legalism. 
As Paul wrote to the Roman believers, if by grace, then it is no longer of works. If it is of works, it is no longer grace. And then in Romans 4, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Now, last Sunday, we talked about characteristics that Peter exhorted to be added to our faith. And it was brought up to me that I was not clear that salvation is not dependent on anything that we do. So I want to make sure that that is understood. The Bible is very clear that salvation cannot be merited. No matter how righteous any one work may be, we still have a handful of wretched deeds worthy of condemnation. God says, be holy for I am holy. Yet we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our works are deficient to save us in every case, but Christ's work on the cross is sufficient, and we receive that by faith according to God's grace. So any degree of earning salvation is false doctrine. And let me illustrate how sneaky Satan puts the idea forward to us. Consider the story of David and Goliath from 1 Samuel 17. We're all very familiar with it, I'm sure. It's common to hear that story taught as an allegory of how we can be courageous in the face of some great enemy, some giant in our life. And it may seem like a perfectly reasonable way to approach the text. We are little David standing against this great giant or in the allegory, uh, some huge problem, some giant hurdle, some terrible difficulty that we are suddenly facing in our lives. So then the moral of the story is that with God's help, we can overcome. But what it really does is change the gospel from a gospel of grace to a gospel of works. You see, in that story, David is a picture of Jesus. Goliath is our great enemy, Satan. We are the Israelites. We are cowering. We are afraid. We are powerless. We are in desperate need of a Savior who can defeat the enemy on our behalf. And that is David. That is Jesus Christ. Changing the story around to us being David essentially destroys this wonderful picture of the gospel given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and makes it a gospel of works. Suddenly, we're the ones who have to defeat the enemy. Now, other false doctrines claim many paths to God. They deny hell. They redefine the person of Jesus Christ. Or they present grace as a license to sin or even as a reason to indulge in sin. More subtly, false teachers allegorize Scripture, as I was just detailing, or they change Scripture, such as in in the David and, and Goliath story, to make it about ourselves or to point it to ourselves, rather than having Scripture, as, it, as it's intended to do, point us to Christ. What is common in all of these possibilities for false teaching is that they put the burden on us on our shoulders, and it's legalism, it's works. Joyce Myers, T.D. Jakes, Joel Osteen, Creflo Dollar, Benny Hinn, Robert Tilton, Paula White, Stephen Furtick, uh, Terry Savelle Foy, Larry Huck, David Crank, Perry Stone, Andy Stanley, Jennifer LeClaire, Bill Johnson, Chris Valatron, Jesse Duplantis, Todd White. There are just too many to name. From prosperity to works-based salvation to modalism to allegorizing scripture to denying the deity of Christ to denying the resurrection to denying the trinity uh, to extremes of Hebrew roots. These people all corrupt biblical Christian doctrine in one way or another. But there are also popular movements in Christianity that are dangerous. There are movements that devalue or that, that, that twist scripture to try and make it mean what it doesn't mean, or to, in order very often to to fleece or even enslave believers. The new apostolic reformation, universalism, word of faith, ecumenism, and and other biblical movements like that do do that. It really is quite amazing how popular many of these teachers and these movements have become, so much so that many of the megachurches in Christianity have these as pastors and are built on these kind of movements. They write books. You probably have a few. They make movies, probably some of your favorites. They have podcasts. They have magazines. They have television shows. I've probably hurt someone's feelings just 
in saying this so far. In the names that I mentioned, the movements I've named, you, you might be thinking, well, he can't be right. I, I, I certainly could not have fallen for that. But I am right. And it's a good demonstration of just how easy it is for us to be deceived. So then given what is going on in Christianity today, it is especially good for Christians to have a knowledge of First and Second Peter. Heresies are becoming very common, commonly accepted as well. And that's because false doctrines are very appealing to our flesh. They sound good. They might make us feel good about ourselves. But every time they move us from grace to works and they place a heavy burden on the hearer. Sometimes they purposely distort what Scripture says, but many times they avoid Scripture altogether and they preach from a foundation of other things like dreams, ideas, experiences, and feelings. And doing this is very dangerous and almost always results in an unscriptural emphasis on man-made things. The Bible warns us about this. In 2 Timothy 4, 3-5, Paul writing to Timothy said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now that time is here, and that time is now, and so it is important that our Christian faith be supported by sound doctrine. Our faith is is based on a specific message. That message, as Paul put it, is in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And to change any of it, to lessen any part of it, or to overemphasize a part, is to change the message. And to change that message is to change the basis of our faith. Focusing too much time on judgment or even focusing too much time on grace, this shifts the basis of faith from Christ to something else. The gospel is what we would call a sacred trust. It's a message that is to be delivered unaltered. The Bible says we are to contend for the faith. That means we are to fight for it with everything we've got. God's word is is truth in a world of falsehood. And the best way to distinguish the truth from falsehood is to know what the truth is. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul told him, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And when it comes to preserving sound doctrine, the stakes are very high. The result of sound doctrine is life, but the result of false doctrine is destruction. And many today are being led toward destruction by those who tell lies and half-truths, bending Scripture, or altogether ignoring Scripture in order to gain fame and to make a profit. Proverbs 22, 28 reads, Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. And this is a concept that we must apply to sound doctrine if it is to be preserved intact. So from the early days of Christianity to today, false teachers have been corrupting the simplicity that is in Christ with their false doctrines. They have been tricking Christians into adopting a merit-based theology. Today, that trend is escalating, and many Christians are buying into it hook, line, and sinker. We need to be able to recognize false teachers, not be shy about calling them out, and be able to recognize true doctrine versus that which is man-made. We are wise to recognize how vulnerable we are to false doctrines, and to make it our habit to do just as the Bereans did in Acts 17.11, they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And when we make sola scriptura, the scripture alone, the goal, setting aside that which is not scriptural, we will go very far in avoiding the pitfalls of false doctrine. Now, scriptura sola, or, or uh, by scripture alone, it's a Latin phrase, uh, and a theological doctrine held by Christian denominations that the Christian scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith and practice. Put simply, nothing needs to be added, nor should it be. We find in 2 Peter an emphasis on the knowledge of God. Peter does not use the word to mean only an intellectual uh, knowledge, but also, also a, a working out or living 
that knowledge, putting it to use, a living participation in the truth. Knowledge of the truth and participation in the truth is important if we are to discern what is counterfeit. Starting with knowledge, the best way for us to detect falsehood is for us to understand the characteristics of truth. So then Peter began his letter describing the true believers and true belief. And this is important to us because false teachers often claim that they have special doctrines that add something to the lives of believers. But there's also participation in the truth. Christians uh, living by de- Christian living by definition is based on the authoritative word of God. Uh, false teachers find it easy to seduce people who keep themselves ignorant of God's word in favor of seeking after experiences with the Lord. It's a dangerous thing to build on subjective experience alone and ignore the written revelation of God in his word. Peter discussed Christian experience in the first half of 2 Peter 1, and in the last half he discussed the revelation that we have in the Word of God. His purpose is to show the importance of knowing God's Word and relying on it completely. The Christian who knows what he believes and why he believes it will rarely be seduced by outside doctrines. In this final section of, of chapter 1, Peter underscores the dependability of and the durability of the Word of God. And he does so by contrasting Scripture with men, experiences, and the world. But first, let's pray, and then we will dig into the text. Lord, as we embark on the study of your Word, we ask that our hearts will be open to receive all that you have to say to us. We desire to be hearers and doers, and for you to lead us in all of your ways. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's dig in, starting with verse 12, 2 Peter 1, starting with verse 12, it says, For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, Peter is speaking of his physical body, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Through their travels, their preaching, their teaching, and their raising up of leaders, the New Testament apostles and prophets laid the foundation of the church. The Bible speaks of Christ being the chief cornerstone that ties the building together. It speaks also of Christ being the foundation upon which the apostles and the prophets built and us believers as the bricks. It's important for us to understand that the New Testament apostles and prophets are not themselves the foundation. Only Christ is the foundation. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If the church is to last, it can't be built on men, nor on the wisdom of men. It must be built on the risen, eternal Son of God. Peter here softens his exhortation, first commending them, saying, though you know and are established in the present truth. That present truth was that they were saved in Christ Jesus, and that was their firm standing. But Peter had a job to do, and it was important for him to follow through with them because his own death was near. Peter's for this reason in verse 12 points us back to the previous paragraph. There we learned last week that the Christian who is sure of his election and calling will not always be on a mountaintop, but he will always be climbing higher. Or we may put it more simply this way, the Christian life begins with faith, But that faith leads to spiritual growth. Not only have Peter's readers heard about the importance of of pursuing godliness already, they have also been obedient to the exhortation. But Peter knows very well how believers can lose their zeal for godliness due to the efforts of the world to conform them uh, to its own mold. And he knew that false teachers would come in and try to create their own thing and and distract believers from the truth. And for this reason, he will continue to exhort his readers as long as he is 
in this tent, speaking of his physical body. And we've seen this before in language that Paul used, so you guys know the drill. In fact, Peter uses this term a second time in verse 14, saying, I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Remember that back in John 21, the Lord had told Peter that uh, how he, that told Peter when he would die and how he would die. Um, the, the verses there, it's verse 18 of John 21. Jesus saying, most surely I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. It's not that, that Peter was fearful of his death. He, he had faced death before. Shortly after Pentecost, Acts 12 records that Peter was put in prison and scheduled to be killed, but he was able to sleep peacefully knowing that God had it in control. And tradition says that Peter was crucified in Rome. Now here in this letter, Peter led on that he knew that he would die soon. So he wanted to take care of his spiritual responsibilities before it was too late. In these first four verses, we find three motives behind Peter's reason for this letter. Look at verse 12. He says, I will not be negligent. Peter was determined to be obedient to Christ's command. Peter had received specific instruction from Christ in Luke 22. Jesus said to Peter, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. So Peter was motivated by Christ's own exhortation to strengthen believers. Another motive is in verse 13. I think it's right. In other words, it's the right thing to do. What is the right thing to do? Peter says it is right for him to stir them up by reminding them. Reminding them of what? Well, reminding them of the word of God, what God has told them. Now, now that we, we have the full canon of Scripture, we do that by studying God's written word. And we find another motive of Peter's in verse 15. In the King James Version, the word is endeavor. But the New King James Version uses will be careful. The NASB says be diligent. And the ESV make every effort. In verse 5 and verse 10 is translated diligence. Now remember from last week, it is the Greek word sputazo, uh, which was before translated diligence, and here will be careful and make every effort. The essence of the word is to be zealous in doing something. Now, what was the target for Peter? The answer is found in the, the word that's repeated several times in these verses, remind you, reminding you, and a reminder of these things. Peter wanted to impress his readers' minds with the word of God so that they would never forget it and ultimately to stir them up. And it's not the same word the author of Hebrews used in Hebrews 10.24, where it says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. There it's uh, paroxysmos, paroxysmos uh, a word meaning stimulate and provoke, even to sharp disagreement. Here it's diahero, which, which speaks of to awaken, to arouse. Now, Peter knew from his own life how our minds can hear the truth, how, uh, how, they grow, how it grows accustomed to it, and eventually can even take it for granted. The readers of this letter, they knew the truth. Peter even said they were established in it. But that was no guarantee that they would always remember the truth and apply it. In John 14... Jesus explained to his disciples that the Holy Spirit would remind them of the lessons they had learned. But repetition was also important, and Jesus often repeated himself when teaching the people. Paul wrote in Philippians 3.1, For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. And I'm sure you've noticed as we've studied through God's word verse by verse that there is a great deal of repetition of themes and of doctrines. As Paul would say, for us, this is safe. Because without doctrine, we don't know what we, would, what we believe. So doctrine is very important in how we understand, but also how we walk out our faith. Now, of course, Peter did ensure that we always have a reminder after his death. We have First and Second Peter, which are a part of our Bibles. But it's important, but it's possible that, that we can also include the Gospel of Mark in reminders. Paul left us with after, or Peter left us with after his death. Tradition says uh, was 
tradition says that, that that gospel actually came out of Peter's preaching material. John Mark compiled it for that book. In the second century, church father Renius said that after the deaths of Peter and Mark, uh, who had been his disciple and interpreter, handing on, hand, handed on in writing the things which it had been Peter's custom to preach. So it's an incredible blessing that we have the written word of God. So then we don't depend on the tradition of men or on memories. We depend on the truth of the eternal written word of God. Memories and traditions are defective and selective. Fortunately, we can depend on the written word of God. Peter continues with verse 16. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The focus in this paragraph is on the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And we find it recorded in Scripture in three of the four Gospels. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's interesting that Matthew, uh, nor Mark, nor Luke actually participated in it. Peter was there. He was an eyewitness to the events with two others. The we in verse 16 refers to himself as well as James and John who were there with him. Now, after those events, Jesus commanded them, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. So after the Lord was raised from the dead, they were free to tell other believers what had happened on the mountain. But what, is, what was the significance of the transfiguration? Well, for one thing, it confirmed Peter's testimony about Jesus Christ. As Peter says in these verses, he saw the Son in his glory, and he heard the Father speak from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Another significance of the transfiguration was for Jesus Christ himself. His suffering and death on the cross was quickly approaching. This was the Father strengthening his Son for what was to come, his sacrifice of himself for the sins of the world. Moses and Elijah were there representing the law and the prophets, which pointed to Jesus' ministry. Now, Jesus would fulfill all those scriptures. Now, there was also a third significance, which has to do with the promised kingdom. In all three Gospels where the account of the transfiguration is recorded, it is introduced with a statement about the kingdom of God. For instance, in Mark 9, it says, Assuredly, assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Jesus promised that before they died, some of the disciples would see the kingdom of God in power. And this took place on the Mount of Transfiguration when our Lord revealed his glory. So it was a word of assurance to the disciples who could not understand our Lord's teaching about the cross. If he were to die... What would happen to the promised kingdom that he had been preaching about all those months? Now, with this information, we can understand why Peter used this event in his letter. He used it because he was refuting the false teaching of some that the kingdom of God would never come. Later in chapter 3, he warns, Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? There were false teachers then, as there are today, who deny the promise of Christ's coming. In the place of God's promises, these counterfeits taught cunningly devised fables that robbed the believers of their blessed hope. Now, fables here is the word mythos, meaning myths, manufactured stories that have no basis in fact. And by the time this letter was being composed, Nero's persecution was in full swing, and Rome's army was headed toward Jerusalem. Most Christians had left Jerusalem and Israel and were living among pagan societies in the, large, uh, in the larger Roman Empire. The Greek and Roman world was full of fables about false gods and false world origin stories. And Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 that a time was coming when professed Christians would not want to hear true doctrine. Instead, they would prefer to hear fables, myths, and lies. Paul even says they willingly turn away their ears from the truth. Paul also warned Titus about Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. 
And Paul gave instructions in 1 Timothy 1.4 and 1 Timothy 4.7 not to heed them, but to refuse them. As we study 2 Peter 2, we will discover that false teachers try to turn people away from the Word of God with fables, but then into deeper experiences that are themselves contrary to the Word. Peter says in chapter 2 that the false teachers use deceptive words instead of God's inspired word. Peter also says that they teach destructive heresies. Peter there says, 2 Peter 2.1, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Now destruction here is apoleia, meaning destruction and waste. The translator's notes say that given the context and the elaboration of the verse, they, they determined the word to mean the heresies are both destructive and they lead to destruction. So then it's a matter of life and death. If a person believes the truth, he will live. If he believes lies, he will die. Again, belief is very important and makes a difference. And by reminding us of the transfiguration, Peter is reminding us of several important doctrines of our faith, present truths that we are established in, but need to be reminded of. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In Mark 8, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? What do you say about Jesus Christ is incredibly important, but also what is the work of Jesus Christ? Why did he come and what did he do? The transfiguration gives us the answer. Moses and Elijah spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. His death was not simply an example. It was an accomplishment. He accomplished something on the cross, the redemption of lost sinners. But false teachers will attempt to allegorize the death and the resurrection of Jesus so that it does not point to his redemptive work, but to a work you have to do instead. Something along the lines of, you need to roll away the stones from your life. We're also reminded of the truth of the scriptures. You know, Moses represented the law, Elijah represented the prophets. Both the law and the prophets point to Jesus Christ, and he fulfilled them both. We believe the Bible because Jesus believed the Bible and said it was the word of God. Those who question the truth and authority of the scriptures are not arguing with Moses, Elijah, or Peter but with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're also reminded of the reality of God's kingdom. At the transfiguration, our Lord made it clear to his followers that his suffering would lead to glory and that the cross would ultimately result in the crown. Peter could not share his experience with us, but he could share the record of that experience so that we could have it permanently in the word of God. It's not necessary for us to try to duplicate the experiences of people in the Bible. The story of David and Goliath is not there to teach us to take on our enemies. It's there to point us to Christ. The experience of the disciples at Pentecost when the church was born is not so that we can try to experience it ourselves. It's there to point us to Christ. The experience of Peter at the transfiguration of Christ is not there for us to try to experience it ourselves. It's there to point us to Christ. Remember how at the beginning of this letter, Peter spoke of like precious faith. This means that our faith gives us an equal standing with the apostles. We don't need to experience all the same things they experienced. God did those things using the apostles for a reason. And that was not to point us to works that we do, but the great work he did through his son, Jesus Christ. All right, verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The way this is phrased makes this a little difficult. An easier translation would be, what we saw on the Mount of Transfiguration makes it even more certain that what is foretold in the prophets about the second coming must be true. The glory of Jesus on the mountaintop, the vision of Moses and Elijah, the voice of the Father, the promise of the kingdom was reaffirmed by Moses, Elijah, and the Son of God and the Father. So it's certain that the second coming and the kingdom is a reality which everyone must expect and for which everyone must prepare. 
As we mentioned already in chapter 3, Peter tells us that false teachers attempt to discredit the promise of his coming, but the scriptures were sure. And it's sad that so many Christians give their attention to false teachers using an excuse like, well, I can eat the meat and throw away the bones. But the Lord says, what is chaff to the wheat? We have the sure word of God. We have no need for the religious inventions and fables of men. And we should have no tolerance for those who twist the scriptures to mean only what they want them to mean. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, the testimony of the Lord is sure. And in Psalm 119, 128, we read, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way. Now, look again at verse 19. Peter called the world a dark place. The Greek word okmeros means desperately dark. The wonderful garden of where human, human history began has become a depressingly dark place. We still see beauty in God's creation, but we see no beauty in what has become of God's creation because of sin. The Bible says that when Jesus Christ began his ministry, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And we are light bearers, taking the light of the gospel into the world. For unbelievers, things will get darker and darker until they end up in eternal darkness. But God's people are looking for the return of Jesus Christ and the dawning of the new day of glory. In chapter 3, Peter wrote that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The false teachers scoffed at the idea of Christ's return and the dawning of a new day, leading people away from the Lord and into disbelief. But Peter affirmed the truth of the sure word of God. To the church, Jesus Christ is the bright and morning star. The promise of his coming shines brightly, no matter how dark the day may be. Verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is one of two important Scriptures affirming the divine inspiration of the Word of God. The other we find in 2 Timothy 3, verses 14-17, through 17, which I'm sure you are very familiar with, but let's, let's go ahead and read it anyway. It says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. This is Paul writing to Timothy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The phrase prophecy of Scripture here speaks of a message from God that was spoken and written down, and that that not by men who used their own ideas, but by men of God who were moved by the Holy Spirit. And the Greek word pharaoh, which is translated moved, means to be borne along, like a ship would be borne along by the wind. The scriptures are God-breathed. What they are not is the inventions of men. And here, once again, Peter was refuting the doctrines of the apostates. In chapter 2, Peter says that they are covetous and teach with deceptive words. And in chapter 3, verse 16, he says that they twist the scriptures to make them mean something else. We find out in chapter 3 that they deny with their own made-up doctrines what scriptures plainly teach. False teachers reveal that they are false Christians, given what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2. There he wrote, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. False teachers claim that they are led by the Spirit, but their handling of the Word of God exposes them. 
that Peter says no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation was not to prohibit the private study of the Bible. False teachers will often try to squash any private Bible study so that people cannot discover their deceptive teaching. Never receive Bible teachers with an open heart, rather with an open Bible. That way you can confirm for yourself what is taught. And remember that the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. So don't confirm just by reading the, the verses that, that, that they're reading. Investigate cross-references and parallel passages. Peter here was not writing primarily about the interpretation of Scripture, but the origin of Scripture. He reminds us that it came by the Holy Spirit through men of God. And since it came by the Spirit, it must be taught by the Spirit. The word private here does not mean secret. It means one's own. In other words, what does this mean to you and how do you feel about this verse are very inappropriate questions. All Scripture is inspired by the Spirit of God, one perfect source, and so it must all hang together. No one Scripture can be divorced from another. If you cherry-pick verses from the Bible, you can prove almost anything. And false teachers very often do that. False teachers often pull one or two verses from out of the text and use them out of context. But in the proper context, Scripture can only mean that which the Holy Spirit intended them to mean. The only way false teachers can move their heretical doctrines is by misusing the Word of God. Someone else we can understand, something else that we can understand from this text is that the Word of God was written to common people. Common people were to read it, understand it by study, by research and teaching, and apply it, led by the same Holy Spirit who inspired it. Pastors can help us to understand and to stay grounded in God's Word, but we must not neglect our own study. And we must be vigilant to make sure that what we are being taught is consistent with the whole of Scripture, it should never be dependent on a particular man. People are fallible. They die, but the Word lives. Experiences are inconsistent and changing, but the Word is solid. It's proven. It's eternal. The believer who builds his life on the Word of God and who looks for the coming of the Savior is not likely to be led astray by false teachers. He will be taught by the Spirit and he will be grounded on the sure word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have had together, worshiping you, studying your word. We thank you that you are faithful, that your mercy endures forever, that you are our faithful creator. Help us to commit ourselves to your faithfulness. Increase our love for one another and for, for all things that you that are of you, Lord, and, and to help us to, uh, uh, to, to love the way that, that you love us. Uh, keep our, our, our hearts and our minds from evil. Keep our hands from evil. Protect us from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. We thank you, Lord, even as we go through trials, because we know that you graciously see us through, but also grow us through our trials. And we ask, Father, that you would be glorified in our trials. Lord, thank you for being our great high priest. We place ourselves before you to do your will. We ask that you would lead us in victory and use us to spread knowledge of Jesus Christ to the unsaved world. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven and to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. 
The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, don't put it off. Take this moment to confess Jesus. I keep dreaming I'll be ready for when it gets real Cross-border